So once again, hello everybody. So let's get started like we normally do. You guys have all done this before. Short period of bell meditation. So wherever you are behind your avatar, get into that nice meditation posture and we'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. All right, so, you know, when you start reading about Buddhism, listening about Buddhism, uh, you hear terms. And sometimes we know what they mean, sometimes we don't, sometimes we think we do and we don't. So today we're going to touch on a, a term, stream enterer. Uh, you may have heard this, you may have seen it in a sutra or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to start out this way. I want you to imagine a pond of still blue water. The surface, excuse me, the surface is smooth and it just mirrors the world around it. And a raindrop falls and strikes the surface 
and it causes concentric ripples that spread from the point of impact out across the pond. Now, in other instances, uh, there's a rain shower and multiple drops strike the surface, causing multiple concentric ripples that disturb the still water. In time, the ripples dissipate and the water calms again. The pond is life. The raindrops are the experiences and situations that can cause disturbances in our lives. And the ripples dissipate due to a serene mind. Is there another, maybe more apt metaphor, though, for the experiences of life? Well, the Buddha actually offered us one. So life is not still, right? Life is dynamic. You know, we talk about the Dharma being dynamic, and Dharma is our life, so it's all dynamic. And life, it's this process of flowing from birth to death, kind of like a stream flows from the wellspring to the ocean. So as a Buddhist, we don't dive into a pool of water. We enter a stream. In the Pali Canon, there is said to be four stages of awakening to the Dharma. And for each stage, there is these things that are called fetters, kind of like hindrances. I think it's just another word, really, for a different kind of hindrance. And there's 10 of them in all. And these must be engaged before we can lead ourselves to a full realization of their, their abandonment and our liberation from these fetters. The stages are this. Belief in existence of self. Doubt about the efficacy of the path, meaning the middle path. Belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals sensual craving and malice, craving for deific existence in material realm, craving for deific existence in immaterial realm, pride, and restlessness and ignorance. So 10 fetters. And in the final stage, we can find ourselves completely ridding ourselves of any effect by these fetters. So first of the four, this is when a person chooses the noble path and they begin to live a good life by avoiding unwholesome thoughts and actions. The catalyst for this choice, maybe it was a discourse that they, they read or a sutra that they sat and listened to or a Dharma talk or as many Buddhists in the West, from a book, and this causes that initial arising of a view of the Dharma. It's like you see it kind of like the sun coming over the mountains. Stream enterers begin by a little suffering because we have to renounce some habits and dispositions. And this is, we don't want to be discouraged by losing these habits and dispositions. What we want to be is motivated by the possibilities of ridding ourselves of those fetters so we can move forward in our practice. So stream enterer is also known as srota apana. That's the Pali word for it. So a stream enterer completely abandons three of the ten fetters in the beginning. Belief in existence of self, so it's all about the not-self. Doubt about the efficacy of the path, meaning skepticism or doubt, great doubt. And belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals. And now I've added this without a period of experiential verification. Because we know that rites and rituals have value if we engage them in the right way, or in a, an appropriate way, if you will. So that's a stream enter. When you first enter the stream, you know, the idea is you take the three refuges, for example. You know, and that says, hey, I'm a Buddhist. But then we have to begin to abandon these fetters. And there are two levels of being a stream entrant. 
there's that person who is practicing diligently, even if they haven't completely abandoned one or more of those three fetters. So this is one who, whose practice has resulted, oh, I'm sorry, that's the second one. The second one is one whose practice has resulted in complete abandon. So in the first case, maybe uh, working real hard on that belief in existence of self. You're working on understanding not self. And with that, you're understanding, trying to understand impermanence and causality. Right? So that's the one you're working on first. And as you do, then you start to see, does the path work? And maybe you can start to relieve some of those doubts about the path. And then you can start looking at rites and rituals and trying them out, experiencing them, and seeing what effect they have on you, right? You can experientially verify them. But that second level is one whose practice has resulted in complete abandonment, right? Have belief in the not-self, right? Um, the path has worked for me, and the rituals, the ones that I use, these rituals of intent, they seem to work for me, or not. So the, there are practices that are necessary to enter the stream. And I find this interesting that this is the, the first, and it seems to be the most important one here, is one must associate with people of integrity, no matter what religion they are, spiritual pursuit they're in, or even a secular position that they hold. The Buddha teaches that having admirable people as friends and companions and colleagues this is important when pursuing the noble path because the enterer will need examples of commitment, virtue, generosity, and awareness in order to pattern their own practice after that. When new folks join us here at the Sangha, that's what you folks do. This is exactly what you are. You are those people of integrity. You are those admirable people that they come and sit with you are the enterers that show them those examples of commitment and virtue and generosity and awareness. We as a group, we're what they begin to pattern themselves after. That's why I tell you guys, be an example, be a good example. The other practice that's really important is taking opportunities to listen deeply to the Dharma. Right? You've got to seek out opportunities to listen to the Dharma. Stream enterer, once uh, hearing the Dharma, then they must go and seek out ways to experientially verify those teachings of impermanence and the not-self and causality. We have to do that through our own thoughts and our own actions so we can abandon those three fetters. Before I go on with this fetters thing, let's keep in mind, we can abandon a fetter, but it can drift back in. Right? It's not like we permanently get rid of them for a while. Now, there will come a time when we can, but for a while, they're going to start, they may leak back in a little bit. You might say, well, I kind of doubt this is working, for example, in my Buddhist practice. But we're always looking to completely abandon them, and we can. The second one is called once returner. So this is someone that those first three fetters, they've just become spontaneous ways of being for someone. Right? There, there is no belief uh, in a permanent self at that point. Uh, there's no doubt that the middle path is the path that they want to tread. And they develop their belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals by verifying them through their own experience. And it just becomes a natural thing, right? We've talked about spontaneity before. You do it so much that it just becomes how you are. So the non-returner, or excuse me, the once-returner, their engagement with the first three fetters has become spontaneous, and they have begun to be mindfully engaged with the next two fetters. Sensual craving. And I will say sensual craving, uh, we can also use maybe unnatural craving. Might be another way to look at that one. 
and the other is malice, which is like hatred or intolerance. Uh, disrespect would fall into that category. So those are the next two fetters. That's what the once returner is working on. So they haven't made it all the way across the stream yet, but they're getting there. Now we know that craving is the number one thing for causing human suffering. So it's a, a not only a big job, but a very important job for that once returner to, to get a handle on their craving. And then get a handle on their hatred and their anger and their intolerance and their disrespect for others. Third is the non-returner. So this is somebody that has gotten complete spontaneity over the first five, five fetters. But they got those under control. Now they're engaging with the final five fetters. Craving for deific existence in the material realm. Craving for deific existence in the immaterial realm. Pride, restlessness, and ignorance. I'm going to touch on the first two there. Uh, these are two that that struck me the first time that I encountered this. Craving for deis deific existence in the material realm. Meaning a deity to watch over or a deity to watch over us. existence in the immaterial realm. Same thing. So this is why elevating Siddhartha, the historical Buddha, elevating him to a godhood kind of status is completely against the stream entry. And then pride. We know about pride, ego, and you know, look at me, I'm so wonderful. Uh, restlessness, uh, you know, we've talked about this is, the, this is the opposite of focus and concentration. And so we work on focus and concentration uh, in order to get a handle on restlessness. And then ignorance. And again, not ignorance in a, a pejorative way, but ignorance in the idea that they just haven't learned. It's not something that they've learned. So ignorance, the antidote to that, of course, is lifelong learning. Right? Always trying to find something new to learn. And the last one is the Arhat. Or if you're a Mahayana person, look at it as the Bodhisattva. Because the last is that through effort and commitment, the body-mind has been ridded of all ten fetters. Now I would, have, I would add a word uh, say, most of the time, or the greatest majority of the time. Because, like I said before, there may always be a little slippage sometimes. So the Arhat, or the Bodhisattva, that's that end point, right? Where you've got it all under control, all ten fetters. That's wonderful if it can happen. So a Buddhist then, again, doesn't dive into a pool of water. They step into a stream. The pursuit of the noble path, if we look at it, is more like a stream than a pool. Because a practitioner, you know, you and I, as we go through life, we've got to flow around boulders of unwholesome thoughts and actions. Because we don't want to allow them to stop us or slow down our progress. Those unwholesome boulders might be a cause for agitation for a time, but once past them, then their effect is allowed to fall away. So just like a stream moves around a boulder in the middle of the stream. The body-mind can respond to moments in life like a stream. A difficult experience will arise that threatens to divert or even halt forward momentum. Well, like that stream encountering a boulder, you just deal with the experience. You flow around it and move on toward the goal of liberation and human flourishing. I wanted to close this with an 
a sutra. This is a sutra from the Ibutaka, the group of fours. It's number 109. They don't have titles other than that. And here it is. Uh, this is, by the way, a translation by Thanissaro Bhikkhu. Uh, so he starts his out rather than, thus have I heard. He starts it this way. This was said by the Blessed One, said by the Arhant, so I have heard. Suppose a man was being carried along by the flow of a river, lovely and alluring. And then another man, with good eyesight, standing on the bank, on seeing him would say, My good man, even though you are being carried along by the flow of the river, lovely and alluring, further down from here is a pool with waves and whirlpools, with monsters and demons. On reaching that pool, you will suffer death or death-like pain. Well, then the first man, hearing the words of the second man, would make an effort with his hands and feet to go against the flow, right? Start paddling like crazy. The Buddha goes on. I have given you this simile to illustrate a meaning. The meaning is this. The flow of the river stands for craving. Lovely and alluring stands for the six internal sense media. Senses. The pool further down stands for the five lower feathers. The waves stand for anger and distress. The whirlpools stand for the five strings of sensuality. The monsters and demons stand for the opposite sex. Against the flow stands for renunciation. Making an effort with hands and feet stands for the arousing of persistence. The man with good eyesight standing on the bank stands for the Tathagata, worthy and rightly self-awakened. Even if it's with pain, you should abandon sensual desires if you aspire to further safety from bondage. Alert, with a mind well released, touch release now here, now there, an attainer of wisdom, having fulfilled the holy life, is said to have gone to the end of the world, gone beyond. 